Thanks, Steve. It's great to do this, as he said, kind of a co-op, uh, the two centers with compliance, integrity, and ethics, and with sports. And if you put those in a Venn diagram, what you end up with is Katie. <laughs> Uh, the Associate Athletic Director for Compliance at Villanova. We've gotten to know each other being on a panel that advises our athletes, our student athletes, on the process of selecting agents and the business side of things. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome her here. And I thought I would have her start off uh, our time together. What I do with a lot of guests is sort of talk about your career arc. Uh, where you were, where you came to be, how you ended up here, and for how long, and kind of if there's an inflection point of your career where you sort of said, okay, I can do this, where you felt like, wow, I made a dent, and I think this can be my career. So I'll turn it over to you and tell us about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, again, I'm Katie. I'm sorry. I'm we're working a cold here, so I apologize for my voice. but. Um, so I did my undergrad at Ithaca College in upstate, in, in upstate New York and um, I was a sport management um, major and I had a minor in legal studies. So coming out of undergrad I, I, I thought I wanted to go to law school. I took the LSAT and I was like nope, do not want to go to law school, <laughs> not for me. So um, you know that kind of was eye-opening but I did have a couple of classes in my, you know, my legal studies uh, minor that kind of helped me decide this may be something that I wanted to do. At the time though when I graduated I didn't know that a position like I'm in right now actually exists because I was at a D3 school um, and you know we're basically there to go to school you know do, uh, play and participate in our sport and really I didn't have any idea that NSA compliance was a thing. So after graduation I actually worked for um, a company uh, in Norristown, they're not there anymore, it was called Threshold Sports. They were the company at the time that ran the um, Philadelphia bicycling race um, and they had events in New York and San Francisco at the time and so um, I had interned with them and I, I did a, a six month stint because their um, busy season is over the summer obviously with the cycling season. Um, and I worked for them uh, after I graduated. That ended and I decided to go um, into uh, something that was familiar with me, having a swimming background and that was being an assistant um, aquatic director at a YMCA. I did that for like two years and um, I really enjoyed it. At the time I didn't have a family so I could, you know, be there all the time and work really, really crazy hours. And I decided that, you know, that's not really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I decided to go back to school and I went and got my master's at Bryant University in Rhode Island. Um, and while one of the reasons that took me there is um, part of the deal with getting my master's was that I, I was also a, um, going to be an assistant swim coach. And so that's where I really kind of di figured out okay, this might be something that I want to do because when I was recruiting student athletes as a swimming coach, I, you know, came across all of these rules that we had to follow. Um, and so I, while I really enjoyed the aspect of coaching and I loved getting my master's, I kind of found this niche of like, okay, there's a lot of different rules, regulations, and bylaws that um, I didn't really know about before. And the interesting thing about being at Bryant at the particular time was they at the time were a division two institution and they were transitioning to becoming a division one um, institution. So part of the deal and going from a D2 school to a D1 school is that your compliance office has to be um, a full time person. And when I got there, their men's lacrosse assistant coach was also the compliance person. So mm. they had to hire um, someone in this transition and they hired someone from within that came out of the financial aid office who was a former student athlete there. She played basketball and she ended up needing a lot of help because we were trying to get this office up and running. So that's really where I discovered, you know, what this position was about. Um, and, you know, when we talk about jobs, a lot of it is sometimes it's who you know and, and, and timing. Um, the timing for me was that I wanted to get back to the Philly area. My um, the then boyfriend, now husband, worked in Philadelphia and um, 
you know, I was offered a compliance, an assistant compliance position at another uh, Philadelphia school. I ended up turning that full-time position down to take the internship here at Villanova based on um, the athletic director's um, recommendation um, from Bryant that, you know, you should really go to Villanova and get the experience, even if it's an internship, because that is a very, you know, well-respected, high academic and athletic institution. Um, and timing just worked out. I was able to, you know, go into, uh, from the internship, go into a, a coordinator role. So that was back in 2008. So I'm coming up on 10 years. Um, and I've just, you know, I've learned a lot and it's been a really great ride. And, and I don't think that, I think I, you know, all of a sudden discovered this, this profession, not even realizing that it was out there, you know, as a student. So um, when I, figured it out at Brian, I was like, okay, this is what I could, could do. Cause I'm sort of someone who likes to run on the straight and narrow. So, um, you know, let, let's follow the rules and like keep it clean. So that's kind of like my background and my, um, how I ended up here today, so. What was your first encounter with what you say, you saw like these, wow, there are these rules, regulations. This is, this is interesting. This is, I'd never seen this before. What was your first encounter with them and what kind of compliance rules? was your first impression of what was going on in this world? Um, I mean, so being a coach for two years, um, it was really the recruiting rules and, and trying to understand and interpret like what those meant and um, making sure that as we were recruiting, recruiting student athletes that we were keeping our logs, making sure that we were monitoring ourselves. Um, being a swim coach, there weren't too many major issues out there from a national standpoint that we really had to worry about. But it was really recruiting and financial aid that um, took me by surprise, like realizing there are rules and regulations in terms of scholarships and, and things that student athletes can and can't accept, so. And just your own personal, what you just said about being <coughs> someone that's very straight and narrow, <clears throat> does it bother you when you see these violations from a personal level or this is like what professionally what you think you're best suited for? Uh, you mean when they happen here? When they happen anywhere. I mean, we'll drill down to here as well, but you seem to have a personality that is, lends itself to this kind of mm -hmm. profession where you, wanna, you don't want to see cheating. I mean, right. you, don't, you don't want to see people cut corners. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the personality, I think, um, first and foremost, we also consider ourselves like a very customer service-based office because, you know, we're not just making sure that we are, are, are not, you know, following the rules. We're educating, monitoring, documenting everything that's happening within our department. So we have to be out there. We have to be in front of student athletes. I see some former student athletes here in the room, um, you know, presenting to everybody. Um, and so you have to have that kind of personality as well. Not be afraid to like go on, up in front of groups and, um, you know, just make it light because sometimes it can be really heavy. Right. In terms of uh, violations, here at Villanova anyway, 99.9% um, .9 of the time um, they are mistakes and it's just, um, you know, a lapse in memory or a, some a forgetfulness or I didn't actually know that rule. I mean, there's so many rules. The book is like over 400 pages long. I don't expect them to know everything, like but I do, <laughs> I do expect them to ask questions. So, I mean, that's really what, how our, we run our office on a day-to-day -day so basis. what happens? Do you make presentations about these rules and regulations to each of our sports? Yeah, so, um, sports? yeah, so, I don't know if you, you know, know some of our, or some of the bigger programs out there, you know, the Notre Dames and, and the Michigans of the world, but their Ohio States, their compliance offices are 10 and 12 people deep. Um, we just had the ability to hire um, and another assistant athletic director and Malcolm Grace um, this past summer, and he um, is now focusing specifically on our men's and women's basketball programs. Um, <coughs> so thankfully, that's occurred. I'm really lucky to be in that position to have that extra body. But if you look at the Ohio State, if you look at um, Tennessee, those programs have s started sort of a trend with their football, um, you know, with their football programs. And they have someone specifically in the compliance office that's a member of our team 
but they may be traveling with the football team. They may be sp specifically doing all the rules education for the football, student athletes, coaches, boosters, parents. Um, so they're really ingrained in that program uh, and they have an, a better sense of what's happening and can catch things prior to them occurring. So I feel like that's what we're doing with um, our new assistant director. Um, but yeah, we, we are tasked with educating all 24 of our sports. So we meet with them, you know, at least five times throughout the year. Um, and we also meet with our coaches. We have at least 11 coaches meetings a year. Uh, we make them only come once in the summer <laughs> to give them a little bit of a break. But that's getting them all in the same room. You might have, um, you know, your track coaches. We have, gosh, at least like six when you count throwers and, and, and distance and everybody else that's a part of the track team. You know, everybody's doing a little bit different with their student athletes. We have to make sure we get them all in the same room, whether it's about a scholarship issue or, um, you know, everything's regulated for them from like the amount of scholarships they can have to the amount of meets, the track meets that they can go to. So um, there's a variety of things that could pop up at any, any time. Um, so student athletes, coaches, um, the athletics department in general. So we have to meet with our strength coaches. We have to meet with our marketing team. We, um, you know, meet with our trainers, our athletic trainers. Um, one of the topics we'll probably talk about is time demands. That's like a really big issue and concern right now. And um, so all of these people in our department really need to know what the rules are so that we can work together, you know, as a department and make sure that we're not you know, in violation of any of those rules. One of the harder pieces of education in our job is getting to the boosters, getting to the parents. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, for, our, for us in our uh, profession, we really try not to reinvent the wheel. You know, we try to rely on some of the other Big East Conference schools for you know, what they're doing, best practices, to make sure that we're implementing the same thing because we are part of one conference. Um, but, you know, those are, when we're talking about boosters, those are the people that are a little bit more difficult to kind of, to gauge and like, and educate. When coaches see you coming, do they think here comes the police? I knew I was gonna get that yeah. question. And how do you, yeah, how do you refrain from that kind of, how do you avoid that kind of perception? Yeah. Of, of compliance. Yeah, so I think when I first started here, there might have been that, um, that thought process by some of our coaches, and that was sort of the mentality, but I, I think you have to do, um, you have to create your culture, just like we have a culture in our athletics department as a whole, like our compliance office. We always wanna have this culture of like having an open door policy, and a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago now, you know, I implemented um, this, and it seems really silly and, and easy to do. We were going to practice, not because there's an issue and I have to like pull somebody off the field because they're not supposed to be practicing or they can't get on the bus, but I'm going to go watch you and as a compliance officer and I'm gonna be in, engaged with your team, not just about rules, but I'm gonna care about you as a student athlete. Um, so I try to, make my staff, force my staff to get out from behind their desks because it can be really easy to get caught up in the day to day, like I'm staring at my computer, I'm in the book, you know, I'm looking at interpretations, like, okay, step back, take an hour, go to field hockey practice, go down to the pool, go to basketball, like, just let those student athletes and coaches know that you're not just there because there's an issue, but because you care. And so I hope that's made a big difference. Um, I mean, Janet's in the room. She knows how many student athletes come into our office and how many coaches come into our office on a daily basis. It's a lot. And there's days where. And are they asking, can I do X, basically? Um, what are they coming in for? Yeah, they're asking, can I do this? Is this permissible? Um, I saw somebody else do that. Like, how are they doing that? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Can you and give us an example? Um, <coughs> like too many <laughs> yeah so I mean I'll just give you a basketball example because prior to Malcolm like that was like a, almost 90% of my focus um, 
So there's a rule in basketball that says when the coaches can go into, um, for recruiting, when they can go into um, <coughs> their, their higher education, or their education, their, um, their high school, they are allowed to, they're not allowed to go um, during the time of day that classes are in session. And that's right in the book. What's not in the book that's an interpretation what in, in our database that coaches don't have access to, only we have access to, is the fact that you cannot go like during lunch. So what our basketball coaches are saying is like, hey, we're hearing you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so are going to these schools and trying to recruit these kids during the lunch period. I, like, we're hearing that, we're seeing that. Is that permissible? <coughs> so it's clearly not in the book. You can interpret the book, like, one way or the other. So we have to make sure that we go and check our database to um, see if there's an answer. If there's an, not an answer, if there's no interpretation, we can try to make one ourselves. We can, uh, based off of you know violations that we see also in the database, so we can reach out to our conference office as well to see whether or not they've got the question, what their feedback is, and sometimes they say no. You as an institution have to decide on your own what you're going to do, but in this case there was an interp, so I was able to email and 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 tell them directly like there may be coaches out there that are doing that. Maybe their compliance office didn't tell them that it wasn't permissible. There's tons of reasons. You know, we've, we've definitely been on the receiving end of like, I'm getting a call because, hey, you know, we heard or saw or something happened and that might be happening at your school. You might want to check it out. Like we do those courtesy calls mm -hmm. to other compliance offices. So in this case, I'm pretty sure basketball asked me two years in a row the same question. <laughs> and I said, no, you can't. You guys can't do it. You can go before the bell. You can go after the bell. You can't go during lunch. Before the opening bell yeah. at school. Yeah. You can be there at 6 in the morning. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then just, just to clarify what you said, you go and you see if there's an interp. Yeah, So an interpretation from another case, from another school, from the Big East, from the NCA? No, so it's from the NCA. There's, um, there's two types of interpretations. There's official interpretations, which are um, considered like precedent, you know, we should really be following those. And there's staff interpretations. Sometimes staff interpretations can like reach a conference or reach an institution and there might be a concern about the interpretation. So the conference will ask the NCA to kind of relook at that interpretation and then it might end up turning into an official interpretation <laughs> that we're actually supposed to really follow. There's also things called educational columns which end up being a lot of Q&As, like the recent Q&A ed column on time demands is like 42 questions long. Really? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and that might, that might be like the second round. I, I've lost track at now this when you point. you say time demands, what coaches can and can't do time-wise with their players? Is that basically? Yeah, so um, just so you guys are aware, like they, there's rules about CARA, Accountable Athletically Related Activities. Two years ago, really what that meant was the number of hours, you know, teams uh, were on the field, in the pool, at practice, in a required, um, you're laughing, don't laugh, <laughs> at a required, you know, film session or, um, uh, you know, things that didn't count were like taping, um, uh, compliance meetings, if they had to meet with us, um, you know, uh, meals, things like that are not required, but... Um, Recently, last year, um, they implemented uh, time demands. So a lot of legislation that sort of increased um, what, so there were, what was happening is national um, student athlete committees were saying basically like, hey, listen, we, we, have, um, we have a lot of things going on in our life, not just practice hours. We also have to do all these other things that we're, are not counting in these hours that were, that were required to be there. So now we have what's called RARA in addition to CARA and it's required athletically related activities. So yeah, we have a lot of like acronyms for everything. So um, we now have to track all of these required athletically related activities. So when I talk about the Q&A, there's an additional 42 Q&A document on, 42 question and answer document on um, these additional things that we're supposed to be tracking now. And it, it gives student athletes additional days off. 
um, days off that they didn't have in the past. Uh, it gives them a day off where they wouldn't, for example, be able to have a compliance meeting with me. In the past, they, were, they used to be able to let, you could go do a compliance meeting, you could go be required to turn your gear back in, you could go be required to um, you know, do something else that wasn't really practice. Now it's like, nope, you have a day off that's your, all yours. So. Now I'm gonna open it up in a little bit, but I, I do have a question. Your general feeling towards parents in terms of, uh, I mean, athletic parents, you get all types, right? Mm -hmm. But how much are they asking you? Can they do something, or is it you coming back to them? What is, I mean, you've got 500 something athletes, right? We have si over 600. 600. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody thinks their child is obviously the most important thing. So talk about your experiences dealing with parents in this role. Honestly, it's been actually fairly limited. Um, in terms of getting questions from parents, the majority of the questions, probably rightfully so as a, as a parent, is, is about money, about scholarships and their financial aid packages and what those look like. Um, but we really leave the dealing with the parents up to the coaches. Um, the other big question we get is just about meals. You know, can we provide student mm -hmm. athletes with meals? And really, the NCAA has sort of taken a, has sort of relaxed their rules about meals that used to be fairly strict, and it kind of seems ridiculous to not be able to feed, you know, right. a student athlete. So um, it's really just about meals. I mean, I don't really have that many questions um, from parents, but one of the things that we're trying to do as a staff to to, to do better is kind of reach out, whether it's. Um, via an email through our coaches to get the parents. We have a parent brochure like on our website that we recently did. Um, we also have a booster brochure. And, and just get the parents that way and at least get them thinking about it because they're not really thinking about it, you know, especially if you're, um, you're not in like one of, you know, the main sports or you're not, your son or daughter are not going to go pro. There's, they want them, they're here for an education. So they might, um, not really be thinking in that, you know, oh gosh, there's rules that I have to follow, so. I think that what you said, for people who don't know, we have 24? We have 24 sports, and we have over 600 student athletes, yeah. and we have an athletics department of over, almost 200 people, I think. And how many in compliance? Well, now I have four full-time. It's myself, Malcolm, Peter, who you guys might know, um, who's our director, and Laura, who is our, um, Director of Financial Aid and Initial Eligibility, so she deals um, pretty much mainly with financial aid. I mean, there's some schools that have their financial aid person, uh, or a financial aid person in their financial aid office that really is in charge of it, but she's in our office. And she also deals with initial eligibility. I mean, so we actually even, we like touch student athletes when they're in high school because we have to make sure that they're eligible when they come here as well. So we are working with our coaches to make sure that they know all of the things that they have to have in place as a high school student prior to even getting here. And we're, you know, you're talking about interpretations. We're also, <coughs> excuse me, doing a lot of waivers. So we do a lot of um, waivers either to the Big East or directly to the NCAA. Um, and that could be for anything. That could be a legislative relief waiver. So it's a, a waiver that we want to, here's the rule and here's why we don't want to follow it, you know. Um, and um, hardship waivers for student athletes who want to gain a season back. Um, be medical as well. <coughs> yeah, excuse me, medical, medical hardship waivers. Um, yeah, a lot of different things like that happen. And I have to ask about, obviously, 24 sports, one is the one everywhere in the country knows, which is obviously <coughs> basketball. But when you see college sports, especially basketball, football, becoming so commercial, so big business, so profitable, dominating Saturday yeah. television viewing, um, do you say, well, you know, it's supposed to be about the student athlete. <coughs> you have your own personal feelings. But as it grows, that's more challenges for you, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you see what's happening, and Villanova basketball is right there, yeah. the top five teams. So that must keep you up at night in terms of all the payments, 
all the violation, what happened with Louisville, and the money, and the yeah. hookers, and everything else. That was part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it does. What do you, does that, I guess, more than keep you up at night, does that, do you have more meetings with players? Do you? Yeah, I mean, so, like I said, we're incredibly fortunate that um, our athletic director wanted to hire someone specifically for those two programs. Um, and, you know, um, I think his background coming from the NSA enforcement staff is really helpful. And um, his, his expertise and his, like, former career as a lobbyist is going to be helpful. We're going to try to add him to our student athlete, uh, elite student athlete panel. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Your focus ends up being so much on, you know, if we had big time football, it would have been on big time football as well. But it, it 15 student athletes take up so much of your time <laughs> and, um, and your rules education because they have a lot of questions. I mean, that's the great thing. I mean, we have a staff that asks a lot of questions. You know, I think the problem is if they're not asking questions, you know, not that they have time to come over to my office, but they are getting on the phone, you know, they're on the road, they're asking the questions prior to, you know, we have to be proactive here, we can't be reactive, because once you're reactive, you already have a problem. So, um, but yeah, I think one of the reasons why, um, like I said, the, some of the schools were, are starting to hire specifically for those big programs, I think we're also um, taking a first step. I think we might be the first in the country to have an athletic director for compliance that's specific for our basketball. Um, so that was kind of unique and actually really great timing after this you know, whole situation came to light. Um, you know, and, and with that, uh, part, of you is, it's, part of you is not surprised. Right. Part of you is, is, is hoping, is really hoping that it's not a part of our institution and, and what we stand for. I have a really great athletic director in Mark Jackson who, unfortunately I was on maternity leave at the time when he started, but from my staff they said literally the first words out of his mouth were compliance. You know, and his, his um, dealing with the issues at USC when he was there. So, I mean, I have the support and backing of, of someone who's been through it. So, you know, whatever we need, we usually get, um, whether it's, you know, more rules with the coaches or m having to meet specifically. But, yeah, you're doing, um, you know, you're doing a lot of rules education specifically with their parents and, um, you know, them as student athletes. And, you know, we meet with them and go over our elite student athlete form kind of brings out a little bit more of their background that you as a compliance officer don't really know, but maybe the coach does because you know they went through the yeah. recruitment process with them. So that's something that we do specifically for our elite student athletes. But um, yeah, it's, it's very, very uh, time consuming. And um, you have to kind of hold their hand a little bit through it, so. And now we do give cost of attendance you can explain what that is to both men's and women's basketball? Yeah. And yeah, so, um, you know, kind of like the big topic a couple years ago, maybe five years ago at this point, was, uh, was cost of attendance. And, you know, it was, again, paying student athletes and how are we going to get them closer to, like, you know, what it actually costs to go to school. Um, and at the time, you know, we have, a, we have our uh, legislative cycle that we go through every year. And um, I think this was before they put a moratorium on it for three years where we didn't have any proposals come through, which was like a godsend <laughs> because we didn't have to learn new rules every single year for three years, which was amazing. Um, they wanted to push through a proposal that would allow uh, institutions to uh, give student athletes an additional $2,000 over and above whatever your, full, your um, scholarship was. Uh, your full scholarship was, and that actually got, um, you know, didn't go through. Right. The membership actually voted no after, like, the board had said, hey, this is what we want to do. We said, hey, let's take a look at a little bit of a closer look at this, and what it, that ended up turning into the cost of attendance rule where every institution has the ability through our financial aid office to make a determination of what is our cost of attendance versus what is St. Joe's cost of attendance? What are the additional dollars that a student is going to spend to go to Villanova 
uh, over and above tuition fees, room, board, and books. So yeah, we do give cost of attendance. It, it's a Big East mandated um, rule that all Big East um, men and women basketball players have their cost of attendance given to them and our, our players get that um, through our bursar's office and they're given it on a monthly basis. What's the figure, ballpark? Um, a little bit over 2,500 a year. 2,500? Yeah. And they get cash? Um, they get, um, they have to have a um, bank account uh, on campus and it goes into their bank account. We didn't want to give it on a lump, lump sum. Right. <laughs> That'd be long gone. Yeah. Before questions, can I, add, can I add, get a show of hands? Uh, student athletes here, former student athletes. And any experiences you want to share or just run by Katie with compliance that sort of stuck out in your career? Anyone want to share, Khalil? Um, being a former football athlete, I specifically remember the compliance meetings where Yes. Players kind of dreaded, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, where you guys kind of go over like you know the hours and stuff like that, and I know some of the athletes kind of laugh a little bit when you talk about the hours, because um, I just don't know how you can actually figure out the amount of hours, especially if it's gonna be 20 hour weeks. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So I'm not gonna talk too much more about that. But um, also in terms of compliance, there was um, there wasn't really. I feel like there wasn't really that much conversation between the athletes and the compliance police at Stanford. Um, about the situation that we had in the summer because for some reason we weren't allowed to um, live on campus during the summer. A lot of people had summer school and we had to actually live with donors like outside of campus, which is a little bit different than most mm. universities. Yeah. Um, and there's been situations to where you would kind of, for your rent, you would be babysitting or doing other chores um, just to make sure that you weren't receiving any type of impossible right. benefits. Right, right, yeah. Um, you know, you would do all that stuff and kind of be with the family, but yet if you go to a movie theater, they can't pay for your right. movie ticket or, right. or a restaurant. Right. They, you have to pay on your own. So yeah. like, that was like the main run-ins that I had with compliance that I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I hear, um, it's nice to hear when I have coaches who we've, we've worked with uh, over the course of a couple years and then they go on to get other jobs, uh, head coaching jobs or other jobs at other institutions, come back and say, well, you guys are killing it. You know, like we have so many compliance meetings. I feel like, you know, that makes me feel really good. Yeah. And I, you know, so we can, you can always do more, you know, but I think our, st I don't know, Janet, like former student athletes that I'm seeing, like you guys are in our office a lot. You know, we, we I think it also is where we're situated. We also um, in our office have our um, director of student services who works closely with you know, um, our career center and making sure our student athletes have that other like 360 degree or yeah, um, like experience, like besides being a student athlete, are you making sure you're utilizing all the other campus resources to your fullest extent, you know? And so she's in our office and that, that brings in kind of like the crowd. So we kind of get those kids to come in and, and just have a conversation. It doesn't even have to be about like, hey, I had a violation, or hey, my coach is doing this. It's just like, hey, how's your day? Like, yeah. this is who I am. Um, we have a very, very outspoken um, female track star who's like literally in her office every single day. We have a phenomenal football player who, like I wanna bring him in and say like, you're on our staff. Like he's in our office every single day. Just even if you have that one person that that makes, you know, that team feel like, hey, they're just people too, like trying to do their job, you know, just. You know, and it really helps. Any shared experience? Oh, I definitely don't have a shared experience. <laughs> 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 I, had, I had a question. Yeah, please identify yourself what year. Um, I'm Lee, I'm a 2L. Um, I was wondering, how did you guys, the office, behave differently after the national championship went? Like, in terms of the guys going pro and like media? Um, the media yeah, it's a really good question. Well, we, I mean, I'll admit, and that's why I'm so thankful that Andrew was on the panel now, we were a little reactive with the agent-ish stuff. Um, so, you know, I think we've, we've kind of tried to tie that up a little bit better this year um, and kind of nail those um, situations down. But um, 
how do we react different? There's just a lot more questions. You know, can we, what can we do with the parade? You know, is it permissible for the parents to be here? Can we give them this? You know, it's just, and that's the best part about it. Like every day you're, you never know what you're gonna get. So it wasn't really that we did anything differently. It was just that everybody was sort of on high alert and available 24 seven because it happened and it was literally nonstop. You know, somebody wants, you know, Josh to throw out the first pitch here all the way through until like the next season started. So um, I think we had really good mechanisms in place already. Um, we didn't really have to change any policy or do anything different on that. It was just sort of like everyone's kind of all hands on deck, you know. I think on the agent side, I was lucky to get involved with Josh and Chris, who went through the agent, ex I'm sorry, the NBA experience their junior year. Right which the NBA greatly allows this, which is so different than the NFL. You can check out your prospects for two months, and they did that. And that was a great experience for them and me to get to know them. So when it would happen, when they came back, mm -hmm. and I was under a lot of pressure to not tell them to go, go to pro. Uh, when they came back, um, it was easy the next time. And, and that change was a huge change that we had to, to go over with the coaches multiple times when they were, when our student athletes were able to, yes, test the waters and then, and then come back in the sport of basketball. Much different than yeah. other sports. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, uh, our role was to, um, Can you identify it, please, or either one of you, the Oh, the Spellman. situation? Yeah. Do you want to, you go ahead. You, what <laughs> do you want to say about <laughs> it? Yeah, I don't know how much is public information, so. Just share what you can. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so, you know, we, when a situation comes to light, whether it's Omari or any other student athlete, we, um, you know, we work with our coaches to figure out, you know, what's the best avenue to take. Uh, in this, in his case, it was um, uh, initial eligibility waiver with the NCAA, and so we, we actually used outside counsel. You know, um, we, um, I work closely with our general counsel here um, on campus and our university compliance office. Um, who also has, she has experience with uh, um, overseeing athletics as well. And so we also have uh, outside counsel that we turn to in situations like this. So I worked um, extensively um, with him. They actually did a lot of the uh, investigation uh, piece of it so that we could make sure that we were presenting our, our best case to the NCAA. And, and it was really just determined, the NCAA had to determine that he was, he was a, a red shirt. So um, I think that's all I can really say. Understood. And if I can just follow up on that, talk a little bit more, if you would, about your relationship with university council, sure. outside council, because compliance is one of those interesting areas where there are both lawyers and non-lawyers yep. working together to try and both create a system and then implement that system. Right, yeah. So. Um, so we work with our legal counsel. Um, a lot of it's on policy, you know, where I might not be as well versed in, um, you know, sort of the legal aspects of what student athletes are signing, um, things like that. So I make sure that they, they are aware and they're checking the boxes whether or not we are presenting this information correctly. Um, there are some instances, whether it's a waiver or, um, issue with agents where we'll, you know, we'll involve our general counsel. I mean, obviously they like to be in the know more than, you know, if something is happening and all of a sudden we're on the news. So, um, you know, I meet with uh, Debbie Fickler, our general counsel, pretty much every six weeks just to go over some of the bigger picture items. Obviously basketball is always on the plate. Um, and then I also meet with our um, university compliance office. Leda is also um, a lawyer and uh, she does a really good job of making sure that we're sort of auditing ourselves, you know, so are you doing this? Are you, um, 
you know, are you, um, give me all of your rules education meetings from this state to this state. So, you know, if we have to go back and we had an issue, we can say, all right, well, guess what, we presented to this particular audience these items, you know, on this, and we gave them rules ed on uh, recruiting this many times over the course of the years that they were here, um, or, you know, just so stuff like that, you know, that's kind of how we work closely with their offices. We, um, you know, any sort of item that has a university uh, policy, whether it's minors on campus, um, so we deal with, uh, our, our coaches have camps, obviously, and they bring minors on campus, so making sure that policy is in, in place and we're following that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we work with them. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Because you said there's a lot of like low level ones, like mistakes. Like, do those get, do you have to report those to somebody? Do those get reported? Like, they just kind of. Yeah, that's a really great question. It's like pretty obvious for me because I've been doing it so long. So there is a, there's a structure. There's, um, essentially three levels of violations. We had a fourth, but they did away with it because it was just like slap on the wrists, um, and nothing would really happen. So there's, um, uh, a level three, a level two, and a level one. So a level one is a severe breach of um, a conduct. Um, level two is a significant breach of conduct, and just a breach of conduct is a level three. And so a majority of ours now fall into level threes. For example, um, when you're talking about transfers, what the, go what the governing body wants to potentially do in the future is make make it so that if a coach were to tamper with a transfer, that would become a level two violation. So there's, there is, you know, this particular bylaw, if you, if you violate it, it's, it's typically going to be a level, a level two. Or um, if you have failure um, to monitor, uh, if you have a charge of failure to monitor, um, or if you have a charge of lack of institutional control, that's gonna automatically be a, a level one. And you see that in some of like the, highly visible cases that are out there in, in the news. Um, in terms of reporting, so we have to report all of our violations to um, the NCAA, and the conference gets to review those. Some conferences decide to review them with you prior to your submission to the NCAA. Ours has told us, you know, just submit it, we'll review it at a later date, and some conferences will have an additional penalty. Like, we, we self-penalize, so we can go into our database where our interpretations are, and we can look up um, our violation, uh, other violations that other schools have had and turned in. Obviously, all the names and the schools are removed from the database, but, so we can go in and see, okay, this is kind of what our, cases like, you know, we have a violation of this particular situation, very, very similar. In, the, in this case, this institution did a letter of adv admonishment for the coach. They provided rules education for all the parties involved. If it's a recruiting violation, maybe they, um, they docked the uh, recruiting coaches, you know, five days, you can't go out on the road, things like that. So you kind of look at what's already happened, the precedent that, that other schools have put forth, and you really don't want to you don't want to ding yourself any more than what other schools are already doing. Um, there are, have been cases where the NCAA has come back and said, no, guess what, this is a little bit more severe, you're gonna have to add this penalty to, um, to, you know, to correct yourself. Um, so that's kind of the system. So I have a database where I can go back and look at all of my violations that I've submitted. It's the same system as where we uh, submit our waivers and our uh, legislative relief waivers as well. Does that help? Okay. Good question, yeah. It seems like you have to have a lot of symbiotic relationship with the Big East, whereas, as everyone knows, Vince Nicastro is still associated with our program, is now Deputy Commissioner. Mm -hmm. And with the NCA, sort of yeah, kind of feeling them out, like, yeah. is this a problem? What do you think? So with the Big East, we definitely have those conversations. Um, the Big East uh, has kind of changed leadership in terms of the people that we talk to uh, from a compliance and governance structure um, position there. 
And so we, there was a, last year was sort of a kind of feeling them out to how they're going to respond to, um, we have something called philosophy interpretation as well that um, kind of allows us to take an extra close look at if an issue, if a student athlete is having an issue and it's, um, it has anything to do with well, student athlete welfare and less to do with like having a recruiting advantage. Is there a way that we can make this permissible mm -hmm. for them? So I think our conference from that perspective has been really flexible for us. Um, we are on the phone with the NCA. Someone will be assigned our, our violation. Someone we, will be assigned our, our waiver or our case that we're presenting to them. And we'll have those conversations. They might call us and say, like, I'm not really understanding what you mean, or have you thought about this bylaw, or have you thought about um, getting there this way? You know, you were, you were off in this direction trying to make it permissible this way, but what about this, this other thing? Um, and it's something where, you know, we have, we have conferences in the summer. We go and the NSA staff is there and they present to us. So there's always like a learning perspective. You know, we're learning whether it's new legislation that's coming forward and kind of how that's going to be interpreted um, so that we can take that from the summer and then, you know, give it to our coaches or our student athletes. So we have a working relationship with the NCAA. They haven't, you know, that turns over a little bit. They'll, those, that, those staff members will sometimes end up at institutions as well in my role. Um, but they, they are 100% always trying to be student athlete like focused. And they want, if they can get there, they want to get there for the student athlete to make whatever it is permissible for them. <laughs> I actually told you back in January. Um, I was thinking about, now that I think about it, you know, the local thing, I, I didn't hear anything about the compliance officer. You know, I'm always hearing coaches and AD and everything, and I don't hear about them. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, are they, are they the ones who turned them in, or are they the ones who were, like, in, complicit with them? I never know that. But Steve's question about, you know, who's watching you? And I, you've got the university council, that's one thing, and you've got university compliance, which I guess is broader education Correct. compliance. Yep. But now I'm wondering, this person, there's a, a faculty member in every Division One school who is the NCAA rep. And they're like appointed by the president to be this completely independent faculty member. Are they watching you? And then even when you, you know, when, when uh, Andrew said, do they, you know, does the team view you as the police when you come in? If you're really tight with them, what's the purpose of this academic advisory <coughs> committee, these three faculty members to meet with you? Are they watching you? Are you? Are they assuring that you're not tight with the team? I mean, I'm just wondering about these, all yeah. these uh, frameworks of watching you to make sure you're doing your job. Oh, gosh, I don't know who's watching me. I mean, yeah, I, so I would... I mean, trust me, we, you have to, I don't know, Janet, you, you know, the, the, the personalities in our office are, you know, we have many heart attacks like on a daily basis because we're double and triple checking ourselves and it's like, I got that question last year, what did I answer? Like, I have to go back and find like the same answer, um, you know, and I feel like we're all watching each other um, and that is a really good question, but generally we just want, you know, we want, want what's best for the student athletes. The coaches, I mean, when you talk about our responsibilities, first and foremost, it's, it's to the institution, right? So we have to protect the institution. We are a member of the NCAA and we have decided to be part of this body that is, um, you know, self-regulatory, self-governance. So I just, I don't even think about that because I, like to think of myself as somebody who's going to hold my myself to those standards. You know, I don't, I don't want the football coach to get away with something that the basketball coaches are not allowed to do. You know, so and and vice versa. I feel like for us, our coaches will be like, "Oh, basketball's doing it." Well, no, they're not. You know, they're really not. And here's why. And every sport is different. You know, it's one of the trends in the future might be, especially for recruiting where we're, you know, we, we went away from individualized like rules for recruiting and now we're, we have 
um, we're kind of back to that now. Like you're seeing men's across, women's across, men's and women's soccer say we want these rules. Everybody else wants these rules in terms of early recruiting and things like that. So yeah, I got legal counsel asking me questions. I got university compliance asking me questions, making sure that we're, what are we doing? Here's the scandal, what are we doing? Right. You know, so uh, we have the athletic director, what are we doing? You know, I mean, I, I'm glad he's not in my office going, well, you have to have five meetings here and you have to do this. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to let us run how we, how we see it. So, I mean, luckily that's, that's how it's been, but that's a really good question. In terms of the FAR, yeah, the FAR is uh, appointed by the president kind of to oversee, um, you know, and make sure the athletic piece is balanced with the academic piece more so. I mean, he does see all of our violations. He sees all of our waivers. So if he has any questions, he can bring those up. You know, well, what, where was this breakdown? You know, what happened here? So, and if we have, if we have any violations, we had a violation this summer that um, Mark wasn't too happy about with me. So, you know, I, I have to answer to him too. So, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a weird question. I'm not quite, um, Unfair? Yeah, a little it's bit. It's okay. Because um, you're not the NCAA, right? So, yeah. Um, why do you think there's such a high standard on these athletes to be in compliance to these rules that other people, if I'm the top engineer at this school and Tesla wants me to, do some work for them and get some money for it. I'm not going to get in trouble, right, from these, from the university. But as an athlete, I would by just getting a drink from somebody after, yeah. after a game, right? So, yeah. what do you think the core reason is that? Is that to protect, protect competition, or you're just just the NCAA saying you're an amateur, you can't do this? Well, if you think about it uh, again, there's there's like a public perception that the the NCAA is just like horrible body of people but really the NCA is, is is its membership and the membership is us and the membership is the presidents and the athletic directors and the coaches and the compliance officers and the student athletes have a voice too voting and saying like this is what we want this is what we don't want and um, it's a really legitimate question and I think what we're tending to see is this like I keep saying the student athlete this idea of student athlete welfare so trying to change the lens a little bit and look at it differently. Is there a way that we can get that student the ability to accept this job or, or whatever it is you're, you know, you're asking, um, where in the past they might have looked at it a little bit different. So um, I think it's, like you said, it's um, comp fair competition and keeping everybody on the equal playing field. Now. You can also argue like that's kind of gone out the window with the Autonomy Five and the Big Five conferences being able to adopt and um, have their own sort of legislation over in this category, which, <coughs> excuse me, uh, institutions like Villanova can decide whether or not we want to opt into that legislation. So, I mean, you are seeing, you know, we used to have one model, now we have two. So we have autonomy legislation over here where the big five institutions are making their own rules. And we have everybody else. So it's interesting. We'll see what happens. Time for one more. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how much interaction do you have with the academic support? <coughs> That's a um, good question. We, um, we have to certify their eligibility every semester. So. Uh, we do that along with our uh, Office of Academic Support for Athletics, which is actually under the provost's office. They're not in the athletic department. Even though they're housed down there, they actually report to the provost. And then we have a person in um, our registrar's office who runs all the data and double and triple checks our numbers uh, for us in terms of progress towards degree and making sure that student athletes are um, uh, you know, doing in the credits and completing the credits that they need each semester. So um, it, it's a lot. It, we have a whole um, chapter on, on eligibility. Uh, Bylaw 14 is all eligibility, and we um, were in that a lot with uh, our academic office, uh, speaking to them pretty much on a, I would say, on at least on a weekly basis. One of the big things, uh, I mean, you guys all know, like the UNC case. So academic fraud. So we, um, you know, were in touch with 
um, our Office of Academic Support and um, our Dean's Council about you know what they need to know in terms of academic fraud at, at the institution and what it looks like for student athletes. This has been great, time flies. Let's thank Katie. Thank you.